love and of sound minds and, and of peace. He gives us this, that we can be the best lights possible in a lost and dying world. Amen. Take advantage of the opportunity. Preachers, I'm encouraging you to bring your congregations. Amen. Yes, sir. Because until the preachers come, they won't have anyone to follow. That's right. Amen. Amen. When you come, they come. Yes. When they see, they will be able to understand from you how important it is. Amen. You are leaders in the community. As your responsibility is, when you see a good thing that glorifies God, you do not allow it to pass. That's right. You take advantage of it because we know not the hour when he will cause us, call us to accountability. Amen. For it is written, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us, preachers as well, yes. shall give an account of himself to God. So then let us not judge one another anymore. But rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Let's work together as the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and glorify him and raise him up so that this community can see us being as one with our Lord Jesus Christ. Pray that we would be. Let's fulfill his prayer, church. Can I get any kind of amen out of that? The church ought to be able to witness when I told you something that's right. Right. Romans chapter 11, 14, verses 11 through 13. That's where it's quoting. That's in God's word. You can look at it for yourself. Amen. Right. God wants us to be accountable. And he's given us some great blessings yes. not to be turned away from. You remember the book of Proverbs, chapter 1? I know you've read it a bunch of times. Yes. But in Proverbs chapter 1, turn around verse 24, God said something way back then, and he's still saying now. And God is trying to speak to us about coming to him and recognizing all the blessings that he wants to afford us, but many times we won't accept them. And in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 24, he said, Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no one would regard it. Because you have disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke, I also will laugh at your calamity. Church, we cannot afford to make God laugh in this concern. Amen. He's given us too many opportunities and too many blessings Amen. not to take advantage of them. Hosea's day, he said, my people perish yes, for lack of knowledge. Then he brought in a, 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 a subordinate passage in there where he said something about the children. He said, your children are going to have trouble in this as well if you don't watch. He said in Hosea 4, verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I also will reject you from being priests for me because you have forgotten the law of God. I will also forget your children. Mm. What is he saying? If you're not an example for them, they have no real understanding of how important it is to have God in your life. Amen. Every parent here has a responsibility Right. To bring up their children in the nurture yes. and the admonition of the Lord. That's the word. Our text this evening is from Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. But I have a subtext this evening that comes along with that from Proverbs 4.23. I'll be talking to you and I'll be sharing some research that we were blessed to receive some weeks ago in Tennessee. And we have already delivered this message in other places to help the congregations recognize how important it is to be diligent about caring and keeping our minds and caring and keeping our minds of our children. Amen. He says in Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart. The thing that God said, I want you to love me with all of. Mm -hmm. yeah. Keep your heart with all diligence. Make sure you're very careful about how you watch it. Mm -hmm. Diligence means make it a priority, the top priority. Mm -hmm. A top priority, not second. It's the top priority. Amen. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. The Jews, during World War II, the Nazi guards loaded thousands of Jews into boxcars, and they offered no resistance whatsoever. Some could not understand how the Jews could so willingly go in and board these trains of death, knowing that that's where they were taking. They told themselves, everything's going to be fine, and they were in good hands. But how could they believe this? 
How could they believe they were in good hands, seeing as how the Nazi rank or the Nazi party had one thing in mind, destroy the Jews at the command of Adolf Hitler? Well, it goes like this. The reason they were so at peace was what was written on the side of the box cars that they were getting into, which was written in French on the door of every one of those box cars were these words, charitable transport company. They were given the illusion that they were in a charitable transport that had their best interests at heart. Have we told ourselves that everything is fine while Satan steals our families from us? Are we looking at really what's really happening around us? You see, we're in a world now where technology has a powerful influence. Let me give you an idea of how powerful influence is. The Maasai tribe of Africa live in huts that have no running water. They live in huts that have no electrical power whatsoever. Many of their homes have dirt floors. But in these dirt floored houses and with no water and no lights, it's amazing when you see those Maasai communicating with cell phones and texting each other and leaving messages for each other on their Facebook. That's the world which we live in. Now that's the age which we're in. On a newscast station I was watching here lately, I, I found something interesting across the screen when 1.4, and I had to run it back because sometimes I'm a little slow, so I ran it back to find out what the 1.4 was talking about. And the 1.4 that was on the screen was 1.4 cents is how much it takes now to make one penny. So it costs more now to make one penny than the penny is worth. But look at the information you receive each and every day. In other words, we're getting information that before would have never been accessible to us. Mm -hmm. We're in the age of information. Right. When you watch TV now, there's one broadcast up here, there's a news going across the bottom, and if you watch, there's news going across the top. That's right. <laughs> they can't even give you all of it. It's so much of it, they, they just bombard you with information. In fact, a few years ago, we wouldn't know about the many things that are going on in the world now. I doubt if we know about China and, 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 and what's going on in Ferguson also. Yeah. There's so many things going on now that it bombards us with so much information that we are overwhelmed with anxiety that we otherwise would not have. Amen. We're in the information age, church. Amen. Technology is good, but it's also being used by Satan right. to yeah. manipulate yeah. our minds. Yeah. Well, the Bible says in the book of 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8, he says, Be sober, be balanced, be vigilant, be alert, because your adversary, your enemy, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. It's a metaphor, but it's telling you that you have an enemy that has not your best interest at heart. And in this age of information, we find that there are a lot of things going on that we may or may not be giving attention to, but God's Word has already warned us, we just have to pay attention to it. Amen. When you look in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 11, it tells us that Paul warned the church at Corinth, one of the best educated churches in the body of Christ, if you read those books that Paul wrote to them, those chapters Paul wrote to them, you find out that they were the most educated people in the body of Christ of any other church body in any other city. Right. And here's what he warned them about. He said, watch out that Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Yeah. And I shared that with you last night, that we need to have some diligence about ourselves. Amen. I shouldn't have to have my preacher read for me Amen. the letter that God sent to me. Right. God was talking to me when he wrote the book and send his love letter to me. God was talking to you when he wrote the book and sent his love letter to you. You shouldn't have to wait from Sunday to Wednesday to read a word from the Lord. Amen. And you shouldn't have to wait until next Sunday to hear some word from the Lord. Amen. God wants to talk to you and I every day. He wants to know if we're listening to what he's asking us to say. God also said, I want you to be prepared, church. 
You remember over in Ephesians 6, 11, what he said? He said, put on the whole armor of God. I want you to be prepared. Do not go in this battle. Do not go in this battle unarmed. Do not go in there ill-prepared. Your enemy is definitely enemy, and he seeks one thing, to destroy you by the power of death. Amen. That's the reason the Hebrew letter tells us in Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 11, that Satan has the power of death. And God the Father, through Jesus Christ, has given us all power to save ourselves through his word. Amen. Amen. That's right. Jesus Christ said, learn of me. That's right. Did he not tell us that, church? Yes. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I want you to walk with me. Let me give you seven things that are influencing our digital age. Can I do that? Yes, Number one, lost time. The loss of family time. We're spending so much time now texting that we don't really have time for God. Yeah. And even though we have the Bible on our telephones, are we using them yeah. as often as we are using them for other things? Yeah. Oh, I know we're texting each other, and I know we're really vicious on this thing called Facebook. I didn't even know that I was on YouTube until somebody called me yesterday and said, I saw you on the TV. I didn't know a thing about it. This man's doing something on you. I had no idea. I'm from another school. I'm from an old kind of place. But my sons even called me and my oldest boy said, I need to talk to you about what you said. I said, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> That's the kind of age we're in now. But we need more time for our families, church. Amen. Let's not be like Cain, who when God said, if you do well, will you not be received? Amen. And he didn't. And let's not be like Jezebel, when God said, I gave her space and time, and she wouldn't change. All right. She wouldn't repent. Let's not be like them, church. Let's remember God is out stretching his hand and he wants us to have time for our families. Amen. The whole book of the Bible deals with family. Yes. From God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and we are his children. Yes. It's all about family. Amen. From the beginning to the end, it's all about family. Amen. And we're losing time in our families. Let me read something from the Gallup poll. George Gallup wrote this and he is the one who gives us the Gallup poll. It said, if more Americans could be persuaded to carve out of their three or four hours of television viewing each day, a period of just five minutes at bedtime to ask their children a simple question, how did things go today? And then listen. And the results in terms of individual families and society as a whole, he said he believes would be highly salutary or terribly profitable. Yeah. It would increase communication between parents and children yeah. about what's important to their children. Because many times when we talk to our children, we talk about what's important to us. But what's important to your child? Yeah. Have you heard your child's heart lately? Mm -hmm. right. Everybody needs to be giving some time to their children. I'm going to show you in a moment why that's so important. Because your children's time is being manipulated. Yeah. And there's probably a child here that's at least seven years old, maybe even younger, that doesn't have access to a cell phone and is very well versed on how to use it. Yeah. In fact, your children may embarrass some of you yeah. on how to handle that cell phone. Yeah. You may think you're ahead up on some things, but they know some, some well, that's what he does. He said, I think it would be highly salutary if you give some time to your children. Take away from your four hours of TV and give them five minutes. Yes, sir. And when we get off from work, we've already discussed this in miracle problems where when a man comes home, he doesn't want to talk to anybody. He's already talked out. His wife can't even get his attention. All he wants to do is sit and view. He doesn't want to be disturbed. Have you noticed that, brothers? Yeah. 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 The average woman will speak about 25 to 35,000 words a year a day. <laughs> and the average man will put out about 10 to 15,000 a day. And so when he gets home, he's already spent his 15,000. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not very much to talk about. There's not very much enthusiasm there. And so he's sitting there watching TV. He's in a zone. He doesn't want to be bothered. 
What we're saying is that's for married people there. That's the problem with married people. But there's also the concern for your children. Yes. Yes. We need to take some time and communicate with them and make sure that they recognize how important they are. Yes. They are important. Number two, loss of childhood or childhood. Our children lose their innocence through the media. I was looking on television while I was in Tennessee the other day, and I'll share this other part in a moment. This young lady, who was about 23, 24 years old, was admiring herself in the bathroom mirror, and she was preparing for a shower. And she was so enamored with herself that she said, I think I'm going to take a picture of myself, a selfie. Is that what it's called? <laughs> I'm going to take a selfie and send it to my boyfriend. So she did. She took a selfie that was very impressive, and she thought it was very impressive, and she hit sin, needless to say, but it didn't go to the boyfriend. You know, to her father. That's the way he responded. He was totally aghast that his daughter was doing this. He was aghast that, that she was sending a, a actual photo of her physicalities on Facebook. You really don't know who's all on Facebook church. And we wonder why we're having rapes and murders and strange people riding by our homes. The media is something that we should respect, but we should respect God and make sure we're doing right by it. Look here, some say media does not influence our children. If that is the case, why are our children using it in our schools? If you go to any school, they're using videos and all manner of media to teach our children. If it's not so, why are the politicians using it to influence our understanding of their position so that we will vote for them? They use the media in such a strong way that as you will see in the next few months because we're coming up on the voting for the, the primary for the House and the, those people that are representatives of us in, in Washington, they're going to be on that television virtually every hour. Because they understand the power of influence. And if it has no influence, why is this brother up here videoing me now? Amen. And you too. Because it's important. Amen. The fourth thing is loss of authority. Constant evil creates in us a warped value of authority. So we begin to undermine our authority at home, at work, at school, and even with God himself. In other words, we look on the media, and the media has such things afforded for us to view. Some of them are not good for us. I was watching a commercial, just a commercial, about Doritos. And uh, the mother got home with the grocery, and she said, can I get some help with the grocery? Or something that day. And some little boy said, I don't know, can you? You know, in my day, that'd have been a nuclear. <laughs> that'd have been nuke that day. All they would have saw was a smoke cloud going up. <laughs> I don't know, can you? I said, what is this? Now, how many children saw that? And how many children get the idea that that's okay? I looked at another program that's on the media. Chris Lee knows best. Chris Lee knows best. And his son was sitting on a cola, and he said, put the cola down. He put it back up anyway. Put the cola down. No, I am an adult. And the guy walked out of the room. That's a new condition right there. That's a situation for nuclear power to come in. In my day, somebody would have said, no, that's not the way we communicate here. I am the parent. And I want to say this while I'm going through here. You better guard your parenthood. It's okay. It's okay to be your child's friend. Yes, sir. But you still got to be a parent. Yes. And when you're a parent, there's one thing you have to respect and keep in respect with your children, and that is you keep your slapping hand free. <laughs> I'll tell you what works now. It's okay to have friendship with them. But there comes a time when they have to recognize who's in charge. Yeah. I'm not advocating abuse, and I don't want anybody to say I'm advocating abuse. I work with children family services, and I have seen it, and I'm not advocating anything like that. But there comes a time when authority has to be respected, and authority has to be present to be respected. Yeah. We're losing feeling through the media. 
Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 9 teaches us, and this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment. Amen. We have to learn to discern, children. We have to learn to discern what the media is doing. Media does not always give us good information to make good judgment from. It teaches our children that they can disrespect parents and it's okay. And I know where this came from. It came from the 50s and 60s. Dr. Spock's book came out and said that we didn't really have to train our children. All we had to do was just let them find their way. You know that's not the truth. God gave children parents to guide them, to protect them, and to show them how to live life in a way that respects God and respects your fellow man. Yeah. Respecting authority is what parents are designed to do, and that is a teaching responsibility that every parent who becomes a parent should recognize. If you're not going to do it right, I suggest to you, leave it alone. Yeah. Don't ruin a child's life because you yourself have no grasp of the responsibility or the level of responsibility that you have in being accountable as a parent. Yeah. And then I want to bring to you a note that came from Glenn and Cindy Cohen. They wrote this book called Your Mama Don't Dance. And she said, and they said, if we as Christian parents, listen carefully, we'll take the time to think for a moment about the window which we often allow our children to gaze through. We surely would draw shade. Then she says, if my children were one day looking out of my bay window into my front yard and discovered that in the yard across the street two unmarried people were passionately engaged in fornication, I would draw shades. Secondly, if my children were looking out and witnessing a stabbing in the street, I would close the curtains and call 911. If on a spring day, a window was open next door, and a man and woman were engaged in shouting all manner of obscenities at each other through their window that was open. I would surely close it. But often in our living rooms, the windows are up, all right. the shades are up, and the curtains are open. Mm -hmm. And the biggest difference I can see is that they are not watching from across the street uh -huh. or from inside out. They are watching from the inside in by observing the internet, Amen. the World Wide Web, mm -hmm. over their cell phone, their notebook, That's right. their laptops, and their home computers. Amen. The pollution of the world has made it its way into the approved setting of our living room mm -hmm. and into the approved setting of our homes. And he has relaxed us beside the window for so long that he is no longer shocked at what he sees on the other side. That's a quote from Glenn and Cindy. In other words, we become so comfortable with looking at sin, it doesn't bother us anymore. That's right. yeah, that's true. We have become numb to sin. We have become tolerant of sin. And our society pushes that before us. Amen. And as I shared with you the other night, it started in the 60s, and I want you to look at what I'm about to say to you. It started in the 60s with do your thing. You can't tell me who to what. Everybody is going to guess. Some of us were there. You can't tell me who to sock it to. So now we come to same-sex marriages. And then the saying is this. It's not you can't tell me who to sock it to. You can't tell me who to love. That's right. Do you know that the people that are advocating this were the people that were saying you can't tell me who to sock it to then? They're the ones in the Senate now. Have you thought of that? They're the leaders of your country. The question is, where are we going from here? And what are your children and your grandchildren going to be singing in a few years? Are we going to repeat this again? Are we going to tolerate it? Are we going to accept it to the point where we don't do anything because we say everything's going to be all right? Well, the child can raise itself. Dr. Spock made a mistake on that. Yes, 
Amen. You can't, let me show you something. I'm from down home in the country. You can't even put out a garden and leave it alone. You buy your seeds and leave them alone. You want to, you just wasted your investment. Every weed in the county will find your garden. <laughs> I mean, you can see y'all in that garden. But if you plant a plant in a garden, it's going to have more competition than anything in that garden from weeds. You don't have to water the weeds. You don't have to feed the weeds. And the weed will outgrow everything you water and feed in that garden. Now the weed is something, what do you call a weed? A misplaced flower. It has no place being there. It's not supposed to be there. Our children cannot rear themselves. And if they are rearing themselves, what is your purpose as a family? Surely you have a purpose, and it's not just to be their friend. Amen. It's to be their instructor. It's to be their guide. It's to be their protector. It's to be their provider. Amen. And many of us are not even willing to provide for our own children. And the media constantly brings this before us. And after a while, we see this so often, we just say, that's just the way it is. Is it? Or is that the way we just come to accept it? God has a plan, church. If Christian parents start acting like Christian parents, God will show us a fruit of our labor. Number six, a loss of relationships. And this is one I think all of us can see. Studies show that many young people are actually losing their ability to relate to one another. In an all-time context, we find this going again and again. It is not uncommon to observe two girls, and I mentioned this the other night, sitting in the same room, mere feet from one another, texting back and forth, and they feel it's easier and safer and more efficient than having a face-to-face -face conversation. Now, I pretty much found this out myself by accident. You know, I call some of y'all on my text phone, cell phone, and I'd ring you on my phone, and I wouldn't get it. I'd get a voicemail or something. Or I didn't get any answer at all. And then I text you and I get an answer just like this. <laughs> I could hardly even get my text through and I got an answer. I got one of these little things, little whistles on it, you know, tell you something's coming through. And as soon as I hit send, the next thing I know is, woo woo. <laughs> well, why couldn't you answer the phone, honey? <laughs> You don't want to talk to me? I think that's what it is. We don't want to have the relationship. We're supposed to have exchange one to another. Amen. But it's becoming so convenient and so comfortable to do it in a technical way so that we don't have to have any contact with each other. We're killing our relationship and our ability to have communications with each other. Amen. And we don't face a lot of issues because we hide behind technocracy. We're not having the success we should have with this church. A loss of priorities. Let me share this with you. In 2010, a study by Oxygen Media and Lightspeed Research sampled the habits of 1,605 young adults. The research found that one-third of the women between the ages of 18 and 34 check their Facebook when they first wake up before they even go to the bathroom. Yes, sir. 21% check it in the middle of the night. And 39% of them declare or admit they are addicted to Facebook. Are we in control here? Before you get to the bathroom? That sounds like an addiction. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says, Watch ye and stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men, be strong. Let him that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. Would you know the signs of addiction when they're coming upon you? Oh, I know it's easy to see them in somebody else, but do you know when you're addicted to something? Mercy. Mm. Do you know when the signs are telling you this is a little bit too much, I can't even get to the bathroom before I look at this phone? Yeah. I'm up in the middle of the night. I wake up and I got to go and find out what's on my Facebook. And then some admit I'm just literally addicted to this phone and this, this, this program that has been given to me. 
This program that keeps me from talking to people. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be found in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Please don't believe that this is not interest. Amen. Please don't believe this is natural because it's not. Amen. I'm going to share something with you. I remember when a telephone was just that. Okay. And I know I've gone back in the time zone. Some of y'all have no idea what I'm about to talk about. I remember when a telephone was just a telephone. What did it do? It called people and it received calls from people. And that was it. It didn't have the weather on it. It didn't have GPSs on it. Are y'all listening? It certainly didn't have Facebook. It didn't have Twitter. Is that right? Twitter? <laughs> It didn't have that. It didn't have any of that. Amen. It didn't have apps of all types. That's right. It just was a phone. That's right. That's right. And now in my hand, I have a literal computer and access to the entire world. Right. Even to my own banker in some cases. Parents now, instead of just taking their child's word for where they're going to be this evening, Make sure that their phone has a device in it so that they can track them down and know where they are. So when they say, where are you? And they say, X, Y, Z, they just punch in and they know exactly where they are. They can tell you if, they, if you're telling the truth or not. Amen. That's pretty heavy. Yeah. I'm glad they didn't have that in my day. I want to share some other things with you. This is part two of my research here. Keep and guard your heart, church, and guard the hearts of your children. Amen. This is very important. Listen to what I'm about to say. What is pornography? It's real. That's right. And it is more real than some of us may know. And some of us know it's real. Because the stats that I have here include some of us. Well, Hello? Amen. All right. Well, let me just get into this. <laughs> pornography is pictures, film, or written material created for sexual enticement yeah. or sexual situations dealing with cohetas, which is sexual contact between male and female. And pornography is everywhere. Facebook, Google, YouTube, well. <laughs> shopping malls, Amen. underwear ads, that includes Victoria's Secret. Right. Uh -oh. Victoria hasn't got many secrets from Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you some stats about pornography. This may not sound like much, but 12% of websites are pornographic. 12%. Well, what does 12% come out to? That's 24,644,172 sites. That's just 12%. The photographic or the pornography industry is larger in revenue than any of the top technology companies involving Microsoft, Global, or Google, I'm sorry, Google, Google, Amazon, eBay, Yahoo, Apple, Netflix, and Earthly combined. Their revenue is bigger than all of them combined. Now, the largest consumers of pornography are between the ages of 12 and 17 years of age. Here's a point to ponder. Our age group is the first generation to grow up with click and point technology. Incest is a part of that technology. Graphic interactions of cohesus, which is sexual interactions, between father and daughter, between father and son, between mother and son, and mother and daughter. Explicit, visual. Can you hear this? Now you can kind of get an understanding why it is so Revenue drawn. This is going on while we're sitting here talking about it. And then we find incest becoming something that's running rampant in our times. That's right. That's right. 
Somebody's viewing this. And not all of us are well. Some of us can't handle viewing things like this. Some of us are not sober. Amen. Some of us are not balanced. The next thing you know, girls are missing. Amen. Women are missing. And we wonder where they went and we can't find them. And we got a suspect and we find out he's not balanced. And what do we find out from him? That he's been watching pornography. Well, to his destruction and to those who become his prey because he becomes a predator. Church, this is where we are today. We're not talking about 1950. We're talking about in the 21st century. Amen. It also says the U.S. Department, the Justice Department, says that 9 out of 10 of our teenagers have viewed pornography online most while doing homework. In fact, teenagers view more porn than any other age group. So it's not just a dirty old man thing. Well, right, preacher. Teenagers. Our teenagers. You say, my children are an exception to the group. How do you know about me? Yeah. My children and I go to bed at night. Well, I got to stand off that too. Don't be shocked at them being so actively involved and interested in looking at pornography because they can look at regular prime time TV and see over 14,000 sexual scenes and references each year. That is 38 of those a day. That comes from battlecry.com. Some of them are watching if loving you is wrong. I don't want to be right. Well. Don't y'all? Don't, don't get quiet on me. <laughs> this is not a hidden TV program. Right. Now your satisfaction. Amen. Y'all don't know what satisfaction is either, do you? You're not going to admit it, are you? You're not going to admit it. But satisfaction is in prime time. And what they're doing in there is explicit. And it encourages adultery. Yes, sir. Talk about it. If loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. It encourages adultery. Yes, I don't know what to say about the have and have nots. What do you say? <laughs> Some of you old remember the bold and beautiful. What do you say? The young and restless. What do you say? We know why our children are young and restless, just like you're young and restless. And yeah, you'll see. It's prime time. People in the bed doing all kinds of things. When I was a young boy, I, I remember Ozzy and Harriet. Somebody in here my age from the human life can have it. All right, all right. Some of y'all not going to admit that in y'all. All right. Ozzy and Harriet, when they had a bed, they were both in separate beds. <laughs> hey, Amen, Ozzy and Harry. They didn't have no bed. Nobody would touch it. Nobody. <laughs> they wouldn't let you see in the bathroom. Nobody even saw a mole. Am I right, Richard? <laughs> None of that. <laughs> Father knows best. Same thing. <laughs> I said, there, he's sitting up in the bed talking off. I said, what the, how you get them children? <laughs> you ain't got to ask that with the bold and beautiful. <laughs> and it's become so commonplace to us, it don't even matter no more. That's just life, honey. It may be, but it's a time when we need to get it, and it's a time when we don't even know about it. I remember our parents, parents just, just keep us in the dark. Some of us anyway. Look how they taught us the birds and bees. What does that have to do with any kind of Birds and bees. But that's how they taught us, is it not? They respected the reality 
idea of what they were talking about, and they did it in figurative way, so as not to be too explicit for us. Amen. They were protecting us Amen. from ourselves. That's not the case anymore. Everything is wide open. And people are looking at everything and they're getting to the point where it's not even a problem. Let me give you some insight. Hotels offer porn. You can go anywhere in America and get a hotel and porn is in there. Your cell phones have it on. So if you got a cell phone in your house, all you have to do is go in there. But sometimes you do it by mistake. I remember one day we were upstairs here at the church. <laughs> Y'all get interested in something. <laughs> now this actually happened. Somebody made a mistake on the computer and typed in dogs. I don't know why they typed it in. Nobody knew. And then all of a sudden all these things started coming up on our screen. And then we walked back in and we said, what is that? <laughs> I don't have to tell you what we saw. Dogs were there. And they weren't the Barbie. <laughs> All right? And all you have to do is know the code, and you hit it, and you can get just about anything that is on a thing. And your children know a lot about that. Yeah. And some of you know a lot about that. You say, oh, you're, you're, you're indicting. I, I got stats on you. You say, on the church, hey, on the church. You want to get some? Yeah. Back in 2004, Family Safe Media reports that 47% of Christian families say pornography is a major problem at home. Uh-oh. 40% of clergy admit to visiting websites that are sexually explicit. This comes from AFA Journal and Oprah Winfrey's transcript. 40% of the preachers and 47% of our families are visiting these websites. The late Prentice Meadows, some of you may remember, may not, he was a great gospel preacher. And a long time ago, he would preach to the preachers, the men that were growing up and going to be preachers, and he told them that pornography was really the elephant sitting in the pew. He was telling them it's ripping the very fabric of spirituality out of the church. John Bankley surveyed Christians from the church and found that of the men, one out of three have viewed porn for more than 25 occasions. That's 73% of all men ages 19 indicate this. 19 to 29 indicate they struggle with internal pornography as a temptation. A lady who did some research in this area by the name of Marie Therese, director of Bethesda's workshop, Treatment Center for Sexual Addiction, says pornography is the drug of choice for Christians. She said, and that women definitely struggle with sexual pornography and other forms of sexual sin as almost the same rate as men. Now these are stats. They are surveyed. Why is pornography so tempting to us? Let's look at some of them. There's three. I'd like you to consider one, it's anonymous. There's no evidence. It used to be tapes, books, <laughs> films, and over here's the big one, a receipt. <laughs> but none of that's visible because of the internet. It's accessible. And all you have to do is be able to afford internet. That's right. And you can see anything you want. And until you tell it or get it something like one of these surveys, no one will let them know. That's one of the problems with it. The other one is affordable. Internet, if you can afford the service, we notice that 70% of the phone uh, pornography hits are done from work or business, computers from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Somebody's not working. 70%, only 30% of the people doing something? 
70% of the hits of pornographic material are done between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. It's affordable and it's also accessible, sometimes by accident, as I told you a while ago. Somebody typed in dolls. Nobody was thinking anything was going to come out of that, but yet that's a code. Dolls and cats and some other thing here. All of those are internet codes that will, and I hope you don't use this. <laughs> I did not give you this for you to go home and test it. Well. It might be too much information for me. I'll give you that. But anyway, it's accessible, it's affordable, and it's anonymous. Nobody will ever know. Now, watch this. The average age of seeing their first pornography material starts at age 11. The age when boys and girls like to go over to each other's house and spend the night. Y'all listening? In the morning hours after parents are asleep, they view pornography because the internet never shuts down. Let me go back to me again in my childhood. When I was a child, <laughs> television went off. <laughs> And a little circle would run around the screen. <laughs> they play the national anthem. You even got white noise or beat, beat or something. You didn't see nothing else after that. <laughs> Not <laughs> So TV went off, sister. TV don't go off and the internet showed up don't go off. You can get up any hour of the night and that thing is on. And anything that is accessible at any other hour of the day is on there. And they pointed out this too. The children don't know, the parents don't know their children many times are using YouTube and using these sites. Because parents go to sleep after the children come over to spend the night and things of this nature. And they go to sleep even when the children are not spending the night. And they go to sleep with the confidence that the children are going to sleep too. But children get up during the night. And they have, like I said, they got cell phones. They have the pad, they have laptops, or they have their own personal computer, and they have access to the internet. And while people are sleeping, they're viewing. And getting ideas that they really can't manage, getting ideas that they really can't handle, influencing them to try things they're not ready for, influencing them to try to take responsibility they have no power of taking on. This is our children between the ages of 11 and up. And we wonder why things are becoming as they are. You see, the devil is manipulating the internet. Again, remember, church, God told us to put on the whole armor of God. Yes. Yes. Amen. We have to protect our families. Right. We have to protect our children. Yes. We have to protect each other. Amen. There are people addicted to pornography. Amen. As the woman said in her program, pornography is the crack cocaine of sexual addiction. It is so hard to get away from because you feel like you need it. And if you don't have it, you get bored, just like any other addiction. When you got an addiction, you got to have what you got to have. And when you don't get what you got to have, you get bored. And boredom is so worrisome to you, you just seek out what you got to have. One thing that's hurting us is we're trying to deny we have a problem. The church is trying to deny that it has a problem. And just as any other addiction, it starts out with citing the problem and identifying the problem and owning up to the problem so that you can deal with the problem. Before you and I had a Christian experience, we had to admit that we were sinners. We had to recognize the fact I need to repent. I need to confess. I need to turn around until I come to that realization. I'm going to keep on saying, I'm going to get it together. Or someday I'm going to do better. Or someday I'm going to be able to beat this thing. But not today. I'm practicing right now, trying to quit. And that's a lie that you tell yourself. Amen. It's an addiction problem. Our children are addicted. Our ministers are addicted. Not all of them. I'm not saying that. I give you the stats. It's only a percentage. But they admitted that they're addicted. Amen. 
The men are admitting they're addicted. Amen. The women are admitting they're addicted. And therefore, we can at least start addressing the issue when we admit we've got a problem. Amen. There is a problem that our children are facing right now, and if we don't address it, I'm telling you, somebody is. I many times bring this subject up in churches, and they tell me, you shouldn't bring that up in church. Sex and all that stuff needs to be brought up somewhere else. That's what's wrong now. Amen. You are letting the government assume your responsibility. You're letting schools assume your responsibility. And you are assuming no responsibility as a parent. You even want to say the church is supposed to assume it. And then when the church addresses it, you say we're out of order. <laughs> well, who's going to address this? Right. Right. Children having children who are not ready to be parents. They're not ready to be accountable. And some of them make it clear they're not ready, ready to be accountable. Then once they find out they're a parent, I'm not going to be there anymore. Yeah. Because they're not ready. But when they see this excitement on a, on a pornography screen and they see all this activity, and they get beside themselves and they don't know what all that is that's going on inside of them. They just know that there's something happening. And it feels real good and it's interesting and I want to see how far we can do I want to do that. And I'm not ready to do that. Some parents have got to stop trying to be a friend and be a parent. <laughs> Because as long as the church turns ahead to this, there's going to be an onslaught of continual births out of wedlock yes. Yes. and people who are not ready to be parents. Yes. And once they get into it, we get all kinds of problems. Abuse, yes. physical abuse, domestic abuse, yes. abandonment, yes. the whole nine yards because we really weren't ready for what we were trying to get into. And our children have to be told this and we are the ones God has given that responsibility. Amen. Your children depend on you to be informed and they want you to help them. Don't let their peer group tell them. Let me show you why. Rehoboam did that. Y'all yes, remember Rehoboam? Yes, Rehoboam was a yeah. Rehoboam had the smartest man in the world for a father. Yes, and he went out and supposedly was securing information on how to run God's people yes. and God's kingdom. And old people told him, back up off the people, cut some slack, learn how to love somebody, learn how to help somebody, learn how to deal with somebody, help them with their problem, and they'll do anything you want them to do. Right. Well, he wasn't satisfied with that. We got his boy. Yeah. 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 Not now one of his boys had any sense. <laughs> they didn't. They said, now your daddy was rough on him. You tell him your little finger's going to be more than his old hand was. And he beat you with whips and we, you going to beat him with scorpions. Now who's going to listen to that? You know ain't nobody going to stay around that. <laughs> that clown went out there and told them that and destroyed the kingdom. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Divided it between 10 and 2. Yeah. And when your children are giving advice from their peers, the same thing's going to happen. Yes, sir. It will ruin them. Their peer groups are not Einstein's. I don't care who the bully is in the group. He's not all that smart anyway. I know how to handle himself better than bullying. <laughs> some of our children idolize some of the worst characters in the community. Yeah. You must really trust me if you got that clock turned around. <laughs> well, I'm going to be kind. I want people to come back tomorrow. I'm going to be kind. I hope I have given you something to concern you. The church is under siege. The enemy is manipulating our children's minds through things that are not good for them, not conducive to their growth and their development. It will corrupt them and it will ruin them. It will ruin them. And we have so many children that are becoming victim of circumstance. So many children that are being kidnapped, abducted. Right here in this city, those three girls were in there nine and ten years from a nutcase that was a sexual predator. He's not the only one. You have a responsibility to take care of your children and your grandchildren. Because they are not partial to whom they will be choosing as prey. I pray these words will encourage you. And I pray that we all come to understand more perfectly how we can play a part in helping our children be properly sexually oriented. Amen.
Teach them how to respect sex and teach them what sex is. Talk with them about it and you'll give them a better communication than any of their peers. Because their peers have no idea what they're talking about. They're going off what they see on those things, on the pornography, programming in the media. But you, you're experienced. And your wisdom is priceless. And yeah, they may get excited when you go, Mama, you don't know nothing. Oh, I made that mistake long ago, Brother Smith. Say my mom didn't know nothing and my grandmother, she had no idea. <laughs> That's what I thought. How could they possibly tell me a man who's in high school? <laughs> Wouldn't make no kind of grade, but I'm in high school. How can they possibly tell me anything? They were born in the 30s. And they were born in the 20s or somewhere back there. And I just found myself thinking they had no clue about what life was about. And by the time my brother Hogan got to be less than 25, the enormity of their wisdom became apparent to me. How wise they were and how far ahead in the game they were. And the things they were saying to me was helping me, if I'd have listened, miss a whole lot of pitfalls, miss a whole lot of what they call traps and entrapments that they had already witnessed that I thought I already knew something about. Had no clue. And because I didn't, I found myself reaping all kinds of consequences that I didn't want to reap. And now I tell my children, listen. I tell my grandchildren, listen. Now watch this, watch this. This is important. What I'm about to say is terribly important. Becoming a friend to your child is one thing. Being a parent to your child is another thing. Develop a relationship with your children. Listen to what I'm saying. Develop a relationship with your children. Reciprocity is terribly invaluable yeah. in yeah. any relationship. And you can hardly tell your children much of anything if there is no relationship. Yeah. 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 you got to spend time with them. Yeah. And you have to listen to them. Yeah. But that's what we're telling them. Yes, but learn how to listen so you'll know what to tell them. Yeah. Develop a relationship so that they recognize you as someone who really has their best interest at heart. Or you'll see them going to gangs who say they love them more than you. <laughs> and the next thing you know, they're in a gang, and the gang shows them what they didn't get at home, and that's somebody that understands what I'm going through. Develop a relationship. I pray God no one was offended last evening that I did not extend the Savior's invitation. Let me tell you why. The philosophy here has been before I left. And I believe Brother Mark has still fostered the same truth. I do not believe evangelism is a mission of a ministry of the church. It is the ministry of the church. Yes. Just because we don't say here, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized right here does not relieve any of us from sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Yeah, right. It's not just the preacher's job. It's all our responsibility right. to carry the gospel to whoever we meet right. and wherever we go. Those people in Acts chapter 8 are my example. They went everywhere preaching the gospel. They were men and women who shared the good news of Jesus Christ. It did not have to be a form of here, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. I really believe in that. The mission of the church is evangelism. I don't have to get on the missionary, uh, not the mission, the, the ministry of evangelism to be an evangelist. I am an evangelist as a Christian. Period. That's what Christians do. They share the good news. We have become so compartmentalized, we're of no significance. If you're not on the ministry of evangelism, that's not your responsibility. I'm a benevolent person. Well, fine, I'm glad you do that, but you still, in your benevolence, share the good news. Well, I'm on the education uh, ministry. Well, share the good news there, too. Now, I'm on the planning committee for how we're going to have our next big dinner day, and you still share the good news. Well, I clean up the lawn out front. Share the good news. Evangelism is a church ministry. He told all of us to go, church. 
And when we get out of this compartmentalized stuff and start realizing our personal responsibility, you won't have to hear, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. You already told somebody that's where we got here. That's right. If anything, you walk with them out front and say, we've already told them the plan of salvation. They are ready to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. Because you did your part. They didn't have to go get the preacher. You learn from studying yourself that you have a God-given responsibility to share the good news of Jesus Christ wherever you may be on your job. And I do say with appropriateness, respect your job. You're there to work for a living. But if you got a break, use your break. Amen. You got lunchtime, use your lunchtime. Amen. But when you're working, don't be fooling with pornography. Amen. Like so many in the percentage I just brought you. Don't be clicking on there watching that mess. Do your job. Amen. Do what they pay you for. Amen. Then when you got some time, that's your time. Share the good news of Jesus Christ. If they tell you not to share it, there at the place, respect that. Get off from work, go somewhere and have coffee with them. Look for a way to help. Share the Jesus Christ that you know. But do not go away from me and say, well, Hogan told me to share it wherever I'm at. I'm on my job. I'm going to say, no, I'm telling you now, you are there to respect the job that you said you were going to do when you said I want it. They hired you because you said you needed some money. And you need somebody to do the form performance of what they have you in there to perform. And when you do that, you have done right by them people. And when you get an opportunity to talk to somebody about Jesus that you're working with on that job, take that opportunity. Because it's one of those things what the scripture calls as often as you have opportunity, do good to all men. Are you here, Mr. Church? So don't be offended that I just bring that up to you. Because I believe you already know what you're supposed to be doing. And those whom you've been talking with and those whom you've been teaching, they are learning. And when they're ready, they'll step out. And you can say, are you ready? I'll go with you. I love you enough to share this with you. I'll go with you. Jesus wants to save you. And I want to be a part of that saving thing that you learn. The grace of God. You hear what I'm saying, church? I'm not trying to change your mind about things, but I'm trying to show you why we do what we do. Amen. I've learned through the years we've become too compartmentalized, too isolated, and too segregated in some of the things we do to be of any profit. That's right. Because we can't break outside of those boundaries. And God, if you ever looked at Jesus Christ, there was never a revolutionary on this planet like him. Amen. Have you ever watched him? Have you ever watched him? Yes. Watch this. He was a friend of publicans and sinners. They condemned him for that. They said he's a friend of publicans and sinners. Therefore, when he touched them people, how in the world are you going to save somebody that you can't talk to? <laughs> how are you going to help somebody you can't be around? You can't even live on the same street. How are you going to help them people? And then accuse them all of being sinners, and you are so clean you can't come close to them. But you're supposed to be not trying. Are you trying to help them become clean? Right. Jesus went to them people, and they condemned him for it. Yeah. Yeah. I hate this reason I hate people that use this terminology, and I'm, I'm close. And y'all know that don't mean nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but I am trying. I'm trying to defend our Well, <laughs> I hate this term. You people. I'm not talking Rachel. I'm talking about you people who are using drugs. You people who are shacking. You people who are addicted. I ain't got no time to be around you people. I hate that. I have a despite for it. Amen. Because it ain't been that long ago that we were the people. Not some of us, every last one of us was a and now you done got into this, this song, and now you are, you people. <laughs> Have you forgot where you came from? You were one of the you people before these people were a you people. Some of these you people followed your old crazy example. I have a problem with it. I really do. But we do the ones who are too good to go back and help those who we left behind. I'm pretty 
you got to understand why I say the things I say. Yes. It's time for the church to grow up. Amen. Paul said, as many as are mature have this mind. Stop all this old silly fighting because that does not glorify God. Amen. You know what it does? It glorifies the devil because the devil's already said, I'm going to embarrass God every chance I get. And you are my vehicle. And every time you and I have some kind of difference that we can't resolve and we cannot get past and we cannot get over. And for years we fight and we fight and we fight. And the light of Christ is never seen in our corner of the world. We are not glorifying God. We are working with the enemy. Amen. And I may say with all the fervor in my heart, you are an enemy of the cross of Jesus Christ. You are crucifying him afresh. And most preachers will not tell you this, but that's what the Hebrew writer said. When you do this kind of foolishness, you crucify Christ all over again. Jesus said, I'll give you an avenue to get out of it if you just do my will and learn how to deny yourself. I'll help you get out of that so you can be useful to the king of glory. And there I start tonight because tomorrow I want to talk to you about a very powerful thing. Forgiveness. Yes, sir. And I'm talking about the forgiveness in the church of God. And I ain't talking about your forgiveness. I'm talking about God's forgiveness. Because God's got a plan for forgiveness. Don't you miss tomorrow. Amen. And it's not because of Bible class tonight either. <laughs> and get out of that. Traditionally, it's on Wednesday night, everybody comes up to Bible class. No, come because we're having a meeting. Yes. And I'm not sharing no garbage. I'm telling you some good news. I'm not up here humming. Mm -hmm. And oh, 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 I ain't doing nothing out of you, I'm telling you something. I'm sharing you something. I'm giving you something you can work with. I got some Bible for you. And God wants you to have it. And if He'll bless me to get down here tomorrow night, I'm going to tell you forgiveness is something you cannot afford not to practice. You say, well, forgiveness is for the other person. No, honey. The forgiveness is to bless you. Come on. Yes, sir. I know I got to sit down, but I'm old now. I'm slow. It took me a while to get my stuff 